Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We're blessed today, alhamdulillah, to be joined by Dr. Farah Islam, who alhamdulillah rabbil alameen um, is one of our research directors at Yaqeen, focusing on psycho-spirituality, alhamdulillah. And, uh, you know, actually, we were introduced to you through Quran 30 for 30 a few years ago. You came on and then you gave like the greatest locker room speech of all time. <laughs> Everyone, like, who is this lady? And then we recruited you, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, and now you're you're one of our uh, esteemed research directors, alhamdulillah. So it's great to have you. And of course, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, uh, always good to see you. How are you holding up after a week of Ramadan, man? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. You haven't been traveling as much. It's been good to have you have you in one place, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just from here, my house and back, that's about it. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. All right, so Sheikh, last time, so the first night of, of 30 for 30, I made a joke that people are still saying wrong, all right? I said, what do you call someone that's on a bike at the gym? And I said, a psychopath. People said a psychopath, right? And, and like, I ha I've had to correct a few people along the way. This is a doctor for us here using this joke. I mean, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to redeem myself today. I'm trying to redeem myself today. Psychopath. Right? Oh, my God. Okay. No, cycle. Excuse me, Dr. Farah. He's, he's, he's. <laughs> I'm making it. I'm making clear what it really meant, right? Okay. But um, I have one to redeem myself today. All right, you ready, Sheikh Abdullah? And it has Listen. to fit within psycho spirituality and, and mental health. All right. Listen. All right. So, Sheikh Abdullah, you have to try to answer this. You ready? Mm. All right. What did the ghost say to the psychiatrist? What did the, the ghost say to the psychiatrist? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. No, <laughs> come on, man. This is a Muslim show. Shit. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what, did the ghost, what did the ghost say to the psych? All right, so you give up, I assume. All right, that that yeah. was your answer. All right. I feel like I used to be somebody. Okay. No, not good. All right. Okay. No. It's a half, half. All right. I thought half, it was half. I feel like I used to be somebody. Yeah. I got that one off the internet. That's not an original. <laughs> oh, no, I don't even do it. I got to no. give credit. Cut you know? it out. Cut it I out. I think it's Cut a good one. All right. I'm not. <laughs> all right, Sheikh. We'll try again tomorrow, inshallah. I guess I should just avoid all mental health related <laughs> um, you know, content in, in this part of the segment. Oh, my goodness. Because that one, because that one wasn't any good. If Tar's on you. Uh, there you go. Okay, mashallah, mashallah. There you go. Jumping her name, yeah. Alhamdulillah. There we go. All right. Zakmullah uh, khair. We are in Juz uh, eight today. Alhamdulillah, and uh, Alhamdulillah, blessed to again be joined by Dr. Farah. And we have, um, you know, a lot, panel, a lot of gems to extract from this particular uh, Juz. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا عن الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So جزء 8 uh, we continue now with سورة الأنعام and we transition from سورة الأنعام to سورة الأعراف and سبحان الله one of the things that I noticed about this transition سورة الأنعام as we said is this powerful defense of Aqidah, this powerful defense of Islamic creed. Uh, it was revealed to the Prophet in one shot in Mecca. Surat al-A'raf also is very much so a defense of the creed. And it has the story of the disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al-An'am is that call to obedience. Al-A'raf is really that story of disobedience. And it goes very beautifully together, even though they were not revealed uh, at the same time. Now, I wanted to focus on um, a very powerful section of this surah that has a sirah context to it, but subhanAllah, more than the sirah context uh, that is uh, assigned to it, you also have the concept of the worldview that we'll speak about and who is a worthy recipient of this revelation, who is the best of those who benefit and act upon this revelation. So to give a little bit of, of background, the ulama say that when Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu converted to Islam, because Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the first 
powerful person in Mecca to convert to Islam. It was it was a page that was turned in the history of the Muslims. Hamza radiallahu anhu brought a level of strength and public defense to the Prophet وسلم, that had not been seen before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse in Fusilat, according to many of the scholars, Respond to that which is evil, with that which is better, and you will find that the one between you and him, there is enmity, will become your close friend, will become like a close friend, a supportive friend to you. So many of the scholars say this was the celebration of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu embracing Islam and the the glad tidings of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to come next, right? And these are really the two powerful figures of Mecca that will embrace Islam and that will serve as that first line of defense for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa literally in the face of great persecution. So that's the beginning. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu converts to Islam, this verse is revealed, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is verse 122, and I'll translate the first part, is the one who was dead and then brought back to life and then given a light by which he walks amongst the people, like the one who is steeped in darkness, and it's as if that person cannot get out of that darkness. And this is the way in which the deeds of the disbelievers have been made appealing to them. So it's a powerful analogy here. Allah describes Umar anhu as a man who was dead and brought back to life and then given a light by which he walks amongst the people. And Allah is saying, is he like the one who's steeped in darkness and stuck in that darkness? And this is powerful in many ways because Allah is likening ignorance to death and knowledge to life. That the knowledge of revelation is life. So we're not talking about grounds anymore. We're not just talking about, you know, the the examples and the analogies of the earth being brought back to life. We're talking about a man's heart, Allah Ta'ala Anhu and Sayyidina Umar Allah Ta'ala Anhu. And the Prophet used to make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to guide the more beloved of the two Umars to him. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu or Amr ibn Hisham who was Abu Jahl. So O oh Allah guide the more beloved of them to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and makes Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu a torchbearer of the deen. You know, one from whom we benefit from until today. So that light by which he was walking amongst the people was not just felt in Mecca the day he became Muslim, but it was felt in Medina. It was felt in his Khilafah, when he spread that light of Islam all over the world, until today, the endless lessons and benefits that we get from the leadership of Umar al Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and of course, the dream of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, of uh, he, seeing Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, drawing water from the well. And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a little bit of weakness in the drawing of the water. Now, of course, this refers to the circumstances of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. And then Umar radiallahu anhu took the bucket from him and Umar radiallahu anhu was able to draw enough water for all of the people and even their animals. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is better than Umar radiallahu anhu, but the fact that Umar radiallahu anhu was able to take this message so far, inherit the khilafah from Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and take this message so far, he's a man walking with a light amongst men and that light transcends even history, subhanAllah. And Allah says, is he like the person who's steeped in darkness and cannot come out of their darkness. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes at that point the difference in people here. What's the difference between Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Jahl? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ آيَةً قَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ حَتَّى نُؤْتَى مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ رُسُلُ اللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whenever the signs of Allah come to them, they say, we will not believe until we're given what was given to the messengers of Allah. And Allah says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows best where to place his message. And this is an interesting um, you know, uh, comparison between Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Jahl. Umar radiallahu anhu was objecting to Islam. And this is hard for some people to maybe understand or comprehend, so please don't misunderstand me. But his opposition to Islam came from a seemingly noble place. Okay? 
he saw the Prophet ﷺ as dividing a society. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was very proud of his society. He's the flag bearer of Quraysh. So his hatred of the Prophet ﷺ is not because he's from Banu Adi and the Prophet ﷺ is from Banu Hashim. And because Umar radiallahu anhu has an envy or a jealousy of him. His hatred is because he's misinformed about who the Prophet ﷺ is, what his message is, and he's seeing the Prophet ﷺ as someone who is pulling society apart. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu thinks he's defending something noble. Abu Jahl knows what the Prophet ﷺ stands for. He's more familiar with the message of the Prophet ﷺ than Umar radiallahu anhu is in the beginning days. But Abu Jahl's opposition is from the lowliest of places. It's that he's from Banu Hashim and I'm from Banu Makhzum. I deserve this message more than him. I deserve this fadl, this bounty more than him. I can't give him that leverage over us. And this is a powerful lesson for us. Don't assume that all of those who oppose Islam are the same. This is hard for us to understand sometimes, but they're not all the same. The Prophet even said in the Battle of Badr when he saw them approaching, he said, if there's any good in these people, it's the one who's riding the red camel. They're all fighting us in Badr, but there's something different. Umar radiallahu anhu's opposition was different. That will help you in your da'wah when you're calling someone to Islam to not immediately assume that they're calling from a place of malice rather than a place of misinformation. Umar radiallahu anhu was misinformed and he was staunch in his opposition from a seemingly noble place to him. But once that was unveiled, once he saw the truth for what it was, who was more dedicated to the truth than Umar radiallahu anhu? And Abu Jahl, no matter how much of the truth you, saw, you showed to him, his heart was incapable because he was a tribalist and all he thought about was position and power. So I'll end with this here. فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدَرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thus whoever Allah wishes to guide, Allah opens his chest to Islam. وَمَنْ يُرِدْ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُ يَجْعَلْ صَدَرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ and the one who Allah wishes to go astray, Allah causes his chest to become constricted as if he was climbing into the sky or trying to climb into the sky. Imagine a person trying to climb into the sky with no stairs and no mechanism. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, ala la That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the, the, the disgrace upon those who do, do not believe. And Ibn Abbas anhuma actually says that a rijs here is actually shaitan. Allah is actually talking about the shaitan. Allah lets that person become assigned to the shaitan. And subhanAllah, look at the difference. Umar radiallahu anhu's dedication to Islam was so strong once he knew it was the truth that shaitan wouldn't even be seen on the same road as him. Abu Jahl, who had a similar personality to Umar radiallahu anhu, but a different motivation, a lowly motivation, and obstructed the path to truth always, Abu Jahl literally is sitting with the shaitan, <laughs> plotting with the shaitan, about how to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is subjected to the shaitan. And so when you show Allah, you want that revelation, you want that Islam, Allah will open your heart to it. When you show Allah that you want shaitan, Allah will assign you to the shaitan and put you at his mercy. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala protect us. And that's going to change your worldview and your approach to the entire world around you. May Allah make us like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and protect us from falling to the diseases that consumed the likes of Abu Jahl. Allahumma ameen. Shaykh Abdullah, tfadl. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'du. And that's a beautiful segue into what I want to speak about as well, being the guidance of Islam, that all of us need a form of guidance to Islam. Some of us have been born Muslim and some of us uh, embraced Islam. As many of you are watching, uh, you converted to Islam. And subhanAllah, as I mentioned many times, we say, uh, those that even say that they may be they are Muslim, they may have had a time in their life well, they, well, when they converted as well. You know, particularly when they probably have went to college and they've had some probing questions about their faith that they weren't able to answer, or they faced something in their life that they said, you know what, I believe that this is the truth. I really do believe that this is the truth, and I want to voluntarily practice my faith. May have had a bad, bad encounter with family members or their tribe or their culture, some practices and thought that that was Islam and realized that it wasn't, but they didn't totally leave the faith because they understood the first pillar of Islam, which kept them in and keeps them going and keeps us strong, inshallah. And those that didn't believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or never knew about the message of Islam, as someone like myself, never really knew what Islam was. 
And as soon as I found out and started to study, it was very much easy for me to accept the message of Islam. And Allah SWT, you know, we say that he wants guidance for you. When you see that in front of you, take that opportunity because it will change your life. And in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al-Hadi, being the ultimate guide, he is the one that nourishes the hearts with the wahi, with the revelation. We find in the Quran, which is so beautiful, how Allah throughout numerous verses makes a, a method or a comparison or a parable, if you will. He compares uh, agriculture in particular and the system, the ecosystems, particularly in the verse I want to talk about is that which deals with the water cycle. When we talk about the water cycle, we talk about the water that comes from the, you know, from the sea. When the sun hits the sea, then it evaporates and gets into a lighter form of gaseous. It turns in, and goes into the clouds, which forms condensation and droplets of water, which eventually goes into the rain, turns into the rain and precipitates the earth, thus causing vegetation. All of this is from Allah without our intervention, subhanAllah. And we see all of this takes place with the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a manifestation of numerous names and attributes that he possesses, subhanAllah. Glory to him, because in each one of these names and attributes, human beings nor any form of creation can compare. Rather, they are part of the system. They have no control over the system, rather they are part of it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the verse in the chapter Al-A'raf, verse number 57 and 58, he says after a'udhu billah min ash-shaytan rajim wa huwa alladhi yursilu ar-riyaha bushran bayna yaday rahmati hatta idha aqalat sahaban thiqalan suqnahu li baladin mayyitin fa anzalna bihi al-ma' fa akhrajna bihi min kulli thamarat kadhalika nukhriju al-mawta la'allakum tadhakkarun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 57 and it is he who sends the winds forth in glad tidings in advance of his mercy in advance of his mercy he is the one that yursil riyah bushran and Allah makes this qaid he makes this certain uh, this 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 particularity because he wants to show that the wind he sends it as a, a form of congratulations or glad tidings because the wind can be sent for other reasons than that opposite than that as we see with the people of ad when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after a'udhu billah minash shaitan rajim fa arsalna alayhim rihan sarsaran fi ayamin nahisat Allah says, and we sent a wind to the people of Ad, uh, Rihan Sarsar. And Sarsar is like a whistling sound that's annoying. You know, when you hear the wind, it is a whistling sound. The scholars mentioned this was a loud sound. Some scholars say that it was for seven consecutive days. And actually, when they describe this whistling sound, it was like metal on rocks. That was the adab. As Allah SWT says in another chapter in the Quran, that this wind that was sent to the people of Ad, that nothing was left except that it was rubble. This wind destroyed everything. And we know the dua, the Prophet Sallallahu when there's wind, you say, oh Allah, I ask you for the good of this wind and the good of what it contains. I seek refuge in, in, in you, Allah, from this wind and the evil that it may contain or what may be within this wind from the adab that it may contain. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is in hadith, it's authentic, that Aisha radiallahu anha, she saw that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever the wind would blow, that his face would change. And Aisha radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anha asked him about that. Because she said the people would be happy that the wind was there because that is a sign of the coming of rain, that there will be some water. But the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, what will save me from the punishment if it is the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is the Prophet ﷺ. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows his greatness and his power and his magnificence and his strength and his mercy, he is the one that says, we are the one that sends down the, the rih, the wind, bushram bayni yaday rahmati, hatta idha aqalat sahaban thiqalan, until, and when, uh, the, the, and when they have carried a heavy laden cloud, we drive it to dead land. When we send this heavy laden cloud, because the clouds, when they have rain, they become quote unquote heavy. And to release that pressure from the cloud, rain comes out of it. The water that's been built up in that cloud it empties it out, which is what we know as rain, therefore causing precipitation, as we talked about before in the water cycle. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we send down this rain to dead barren land, to dead barren land. You notice how he says, 
we send it because it was probably in an area that did not need it based on his knowledge, subhanahu. But he sends it to an area that is because of his mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَخْرَجَنَا بِهِ مِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ And we have caused everything, all the fruits of every kind to come out from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, كَذَلِكَ نُخْرِجُ الْمَوْتَى لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ And for that, we raise the dead that you may take heed. So here, Allah makes a comparison with the water cycle and how rain comes from the clouds and down. Rain comes from the clouds and further provides vegetation, which we all need without our intervention. You know, having the organic, quote unquote, food, if you will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ نُخْرِجُ الْمَوْتَى In this way, we bring the dead, we raise the dead that you may take heed. This is a clear proof of what we talked about other days, uh, the resurrection. That we in Islam believe that there is a resurrection, that we will all go back to him. Also, as scholars have mentioned, this is a proof as well that Allah brings life to the dead hearts. The hearts, there are hearts out there that are dead, that are that are void of the remembrance of Allah, of belief in Allah, of mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is the one, if the individual, the individual makes the effort, will bring that heart to life. That's why in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for the good land, vegetation comes forth in abundance by the command of its Lord. Whereas from the bad land, only poor vegetation comes forth. Thus, we expound our signs in diverse ways for people who are grateful. So those that may have the bad heart, that may have a heart to where they don't want to hear the message of God. They don't want to hear about the Quran. When you to remind them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind them about goodness, they don't want to hear it. And there may be some people that you are calling to the truth. How many of my friends and family have tried to call to the faith of Islam? But I think that they're going to embrace, and many of you out there from family members and friends, but there's some reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want it to happen yet. And that's why what's so beautiful here, that when he mentions, as for the good land, vegetation comes forth in abundance, bi-idhni rabbi. You may be that person that wants to cause reconciliation between two people. You, have the, you, say the, you say the right things at the right time and the right place, but you didn't ask for the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Shura Abe said. Wa ma tawfiqi illa billah. That my tawfiq is not except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my true success. So remembering in this beautiful verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the comparison that he makes, the next time you go out and you see barren land or look on your front lawn or garden with your, with your children, which I highly advise to see the creation of Allah, that he has ultimate control and in his hands is the ultimate guidance in bringing life to the dead or bringing bringing us back to our faith and enriching us with this beautiful message of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that choose the guidance and allow us to be in the guidance within, as we ask him, fis sirat, dina sirat al-mustaqim, to keep us on this straight path. Inna huwa li yudha alika. Barakallahu fiqh. Barakallahu fiqh, Shaykh Dr. Farah, please, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. And that actually beautifully dovetails into my talk as well, where we're going to be talking about the the marvels of the incredible universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. So bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam, ala rasulinahim kareem. There are nine verses in the Quran that have the beautiful phrase, Tabarak Allah or Tabarak al Nabi. Blessed is Allah or blessed is He. And all these verses talk about things, actions, events that remind us of the majesty, the might, the power, and the grandeur of our Creator. The earliest mention in the Quran of the word Tabarak is in Surah Al A'raf, in Juz 8, where we are today where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he positioned himself on the throne. He covers the day with the night that pursues it swiftly. He created the sun and the moon and the stars and subjugated them to his command. And to him alone belong the creation and the command. Blessed is Allah, tabarak Allah, Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. It reminded me of this documentary that I watched with my son about this Inuit hunter who was up in the Arctic. And in one scene, you have these beautiful scapes of glaciers of ice and snow, just raw and powerful, rising out of the water. 
dwarfing this man. And the Inuit hunter says he feels overwhelmed when he's out there hunting. He feels completely overpowered, like he has no control. And that's why he loves it. He says that in relinquishing that need for control, he finds complete freedom. And I watched that and I thought, SubhanAllah, that's deep, right? We've been doing this fascinating research at Yaqeen looking at uncertainty and tolerance. Basically, that's this idea that human beings are incredibly uncomfortable with the idea of not being in control. And here you have this hunter who so beautifully is expressing that he loves being out in the wild because it reminds him that he's not in control. When we look up at the stars, when we drink in the immensity of that black velvet darkness that is the night sky, we are reminded of our Rabb, that he is the only one who is in full control. Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. Blessed is he in whose hand lies all dominion. We're reminded of the sheer awe of our creator. It's humbling and it's powerful. I remember reading this book years ago where it was talking about this mother who was driving her son home one day and she suddenly had a stroke. And the boy saw his mother, you can imagine he's at the back and he watches his mother go limp and the car starts to you know, veer out of control. And so the boy unfastens his seatbelt, leans out into the front of the car and tries to overtake the steering wheel from his mom. And what I find remarkable about this story are the boy's actions when he saw that he couldn't steer the car, when he came to the realization that he couldn't control the vehicle, he let go and he sat back in his seat, fastened back his seatbelt and let the car go where it would. And alhamdulillah, because of his actions, he saved his life. Like the Inuit hunter, like that little boy, we don't want to be in control. And I know that sounds weird, but all of us deep down, doesn't matter what we believe in, we recognize that we don't have full control over our lives. None of us do. Gabor Mate, who is this physician who does a lot of work in the field of trauma, talks about this concept of futility exercises. Basically, children, for example, need to accept that sometimes they're just not going to get their way, right? Your toddler can fight you all they want, you know, about not wanting to hold your hand. But when it comes time to, you know, cross into that busy intersection, your son's going to have to hold your hand, right? That's, there, there are no, um, there's no argument there. You can have your tantrums, you can cry it out, whatever you need to do. But when it comes time, when we take that first step together, you're going to hold mama's hand, right? So children need these experiences where their frustration turns to futility. And, and if they have, for example, caregivers that constantly indulge them in that, in that moment, for example, uh, give in to their demands or try to distract them away, as in give them gifts or bribes in those moments so they don't have to deal with that frustration of that moment, they don't go through this natural processing of these difficult emotions when things don't go their way. And this stunts their resilience. Now forget about children, adults need futility exercises and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trains us through them as well. And of course there's this balance as well, right? We need moments where in order to adapt our adaptability, we need to be able to have times where our actions matter and we exercise our agency and our free will. But we also need to have moments in our life where we eat some humble pie and know that sometimes our actions are indeed futile. Talking about futility, have you ever watched a fly incessantly bang up against a window over and over again, right? And you, you wonder, you know, what's going on, right? But in the same way, us human beings often find ourselves trapped in the same patterns of behavior, even when we know there is no way out. Sometimes you don't get to grow up to be a doctor. Sometimes words can't be unsaid. Sometimes we have to face the one who broke us. Sometimes the one you love walks away and never comes back. Sometimes we just have to do our best, rely on Allah and course correct, banging up against that same window or white knuckling that steering wheel when you know you can't drive will only destroy you. 
there's this place that we love to go up north. And I know what you're thinking. What is it with these Canadians? They go even further up north. But yes, alhamdulillah, hear me out. It is this beautiful place, subhanAllah, where the tallest, greatest things that surround us are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. The mountains, the trees, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big backyard astronomer, right? Tabarak al-Nabi ja'ala fi sama'i buruja. That's my favorite verse to say when I look up at the stars. Blessed is he who has placed constellations in the sky. Like the Inuit hunter, I love being engulfed by the bigness of it all. And let me tell you how surreal it is to drive back into the city and slowly watch as that concrete jungle overtakes us again. Right? The buildings start to get larger and larger. The lights get brighter and brighter until you don't see the mountains, you don't see the trees, and we stop seeing the stars. Why do we do that? And I mean this more than just the buildings that we build or the concrete boxes that we construct around ourselves and imprison ourselves into. What about the monuments and the walls that we build in here and in here, in our hearts and in our minds? Why did we ever have the folly to believe that we could create something greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We build these walls, not of concrete, but of elaborate judgments, dividers designed to shut people out. We place our desires, our passions, our love, our hate above our Rabb. Because we think we know better. We get blinded and we forget, we stop to forget to, you know, we forget to feel overwhelmed like that Inuit hunter out there engulfed by the glaciers and the ice flows around him. Instead, we build these fragile, fragile monuments of dust and dreams, like Sheikh Omar was mentioning. You know, of, of you know, using trying to climb up into the sky even without a ladder or without anything. And all of this makes us forget our Lord. I find that so much of growing older is about unlearning. And one thing I keep coming back to over and over again is this beautiful hadith, and I'm gonna paraphrase that here. It says, Do not hate in excess and do not love in excess. For the one you hate may one day become the one you love, and the one you love may become the one you hate. I have done both and been broken by both. Our love and our hate need to be tempered. Think about how Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, that one of the wisdoms behind that dream of asking him to sacrifice his son was to demonstrate that his love of Allah was greater than his love for anything else in this dunya, even greater than the love for his child. If what you love or who you love is taken from you, it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bring you closer to himself out of his love for you. And though that loss may destroy you, it can also make you. Islam means submission. And the greatest surrender is to his will. And this letting go is so powerful in relinquishing our illusion of control. In that is the greatest reclamation of our power. That is where we find our freedom. Oh Allah, make us of those who hold you in awe. Make us of those who meet you with a sound and submitted heart. Tabarak Allah, ameen, ya Rabbi alameen. Jazakallah khair, very powerful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you. Uh, SubhanAllah, funny enough, <clears throat> this past weekend, <laughs> uh, some of you saw Ariel, Sheikh Abdullah knows Ariel really well. So she, Ariel on the Jannah interviews. So we went out to play football on Saturday after Tarawih. <clears throat> and we had a group of guys and we went out to the football field and then the lights all shut off. And like this field out out there. And, and um, you know, while everyone's trying to figure out how to get the lights back on, we ended up having like this long conversation about how beautiful the stars were. Like, wow, SubhanAllah, look at these stars. Tabarakallah. Because we you don't notice the stars with all the light pollution. You, you really don't. And so it was just amazing that suddenly captured by the stars and you got guys pulling their phones out to like talk about like when they went to like this place and that place and they could see stars and this is reminding them of those days and it was a beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that regard that you look up and you see them and, and what what stops us from seeing them light pollution the stars are there the whole time but it's light pollution yeah. so going out to see them and getting away from the pollution right and I think that that's a spiritually uh, apt message as well that you have to get away from the pollution and, and make the effort to go see them and the way the ulama described that ayah that, that i 
uh, spoke about um, where Allah subhanahu wa mentions the asla'adu fi sama as if they're trying to cycle into the into the sky is that they're too small for this revelation. SubhanAllah, like you'll see the ulama describe it like you're too small for this revelation, like your heart is too small. It's not it's not it's not big enough to encompass what Allah Azza wa is trying to give you uh, from above. And that is the effort that we have to make. So subhanAllah, that was a powerful uh, message, Dr. Farah. I kind of wish I my my um my beginning joke was about Canada. Uh, you know, <laughs> I took the harder route. I, I should have I should have took the Canada route. It's pretty easy, but we'll have other Canadians Canadian. are always the low blow, right? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we got we got we got Dr. Nazar and we've got some other Canadians coming on. We'll save it for we'll save it for them, inshallah. But um Zakmullah had powerful message. Sheikh Abdullah, I want to give you a chance to share a reflection, obviously, um, before we close off. No, mashallah, it's very, very powerful, very, very eloquent as usual. I was just thinking the whole time while she was talking, I was just thinking, I wanted to get my mic and just drop it. <laughs> just, just the mic drop, just it would have been too loud, so you know it would have messed up. So, but it was very good. Just I just love how you just talk about how we have no ultimate control, and I think it's very important for us as human beings to remember that, and that really brings the Islam, right, the submission and surrender, uh, and to know when to let go. Like you mentioned, the example with the the young boy in the car. He is beautiful, just just phenomenal uh, example. Mashallah to Barak. We need we need to know and to let go and to just put our seatbelt on. You know, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. Excellent. Dr. Farah, any last word? Oh jazakumullah khair. And it's always beautiful. Alhamdulillah. I was I was thinking about um when you were you were talking, um, mashallah, some quotes from Anwab al Sayyabin Ibn al Qayyim Rahimahullah that some you know that uh you know, of, of basically of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of reviving the heart through wahi. And there was just so many, so many beautiful, so many beautiful gems in, in what both of you said, alhamdulillah, that reminded me of that. Just, yeah, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you and bless your family and all of our brothers and sisters in Canada as well. Uh, inshallah, we look forward to having you again soon with the night time. Jazakum Allah everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.